Okay. Yeah. So I think we can start now. So what I was saying is that um, yeah, I'm almost done writing the study guide for the final. I'll probably send it to you by tomorrow or Friday, the latest. My idea, I mean, it is a final, it is cumulative, but in a sense, like um, many of the, like in linear algebra, as you have noted, there are not too many techniques that you learn, like basically it's how to reduce matrices, find determinants, and maybe now finding certain dot products. So uh, my focus will be mostly on the new stuff. Uh, there might be one or two questions which you may have seen on the previous midterms, but not more than that. So like at least 75% of the problems will be like kind of new problems, since if you know what I mean. But um, but yeah, I'll give you more details about that on the study guide. Um, my plan, I thought about it a little bit more. So my plan, I think I'll finish the, I think I can finish the material for the final next Monday. So next Wednesday, we will do like a review session. And then the last Monday, which the last day of class, I kind of either I spend like maybe 10 or 15 minutes telling you about how to use the least words method, which is kind of cute, but that wouldn't be included on the final just to leave it outside. And then the remaining of the class, like if someone wants to, you know, we can go over like more like questions that you had, more like, a, um, you know, flip it a little bit, like kind of like an extended office hours which is a little bit different from the review because in the review, you just come up with the problem. So you, if you still have quest specific questions, we can just do it a month on that Monday. Yeah. Are we gonna have any more homework? Or we... uh, I think I'll just post one more. Yeah, yeah. I, I also have to post the, the, the solutions for the previous one. I'll also do this this week. If I haven't done it by once Friday, just email me all. But, uh, the writing the solutions is not too long. It's just uh, some, uh, sometimes I forget. So, but yeah, no, I think that's my intention so that you have like the last day kind of, you can feel uh, free to more like ask me questions. Uh, so whatever, like um, the, yeah, the plan would be to like finish the material basically by uh, next Monday. Um, so there's not many things left actually. After we finish the material on Monday, you said there will be a specific review question? The, the review will be Wednesday of next week. Wednesday of next week. Yeah, and then there's the last day of class, which would that which is another Monday, right? Monday, what, first or second, something like that? Yeah. And then there, I may spend, like, if I didn't get a chance to tell you about least first method, uh, I would tell, I'll just use the first 10 or 20 minutes saying how it works, but I wouldn't include it in the final. But it's a useful, it's a nice application to have. And then the rest, you if you want to, if you had a specific questions, you can just come. I mean, you we can just discuss them, like more like some sort of like in person office hours, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. I ju I just don't want to wait until have the review on the same week as the final exam period. That's basically what I decided. So that's why I prefer to do it next week. Um, does that make sense? Um, Okay, so let me um, just write down a little bit more precisely what was what we did last time with this conic section sections uh, business. Again, like a conic equation is something like for I mean mostly for hyperbola, parabolas, elli um, ellipses. Uh, the, the thing is like sometimes it, they're not easy to recognize. In fact, like, you know, in, in, a, in geometry, like one of the things you, you would see or may have seen is that these like kind of have in general like this, I, I mean, there's like a slightly more general version of them, but for us, um, the way we, let me see if I, I'm writing this. On my notes. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so in that's kind of like the equation of a conic uh, equation, a conic, conic, conic uh, section. Here, A, B, C, D are just constants. Uh, the thing is that if we didn't have like the, what you might call like the mixed term, right, this thing that combines X and Y, there is actually not that diff difficult to like, um, identify identify the equations. Um, right, I should put like your line, like here I would, I could put lines also. I mean, because like here you get a line by putting like A equals zero, for example. Um, parabolas, you need like what? You would need something, uh, again, like you can add more terms to this, but um, I don't want to worry too much about it. So I'll just, um, let me read. Yeah, let me, let me just put it a bit. Uh, hyperbolas. Wow. Ellipses. And lines would come, would follow into very special cases here, depending on how you write it. And also parabolas, but I guess they are not necessarily going to be covered by 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 this case uh, because I'm treating it a little bit less general. But like just hyperbolas and ellipses are, are good enough to illustrate um, what's going to happen. So the idea is that right if you didn't have this um, term, like it's actually kind of easy to identify the equation. It would be either like a ellipse if like both A and B are positive. And if A and B have opposite signs, for example, it would be like a hyperbola. Uh, the thing is like the mixed term like kind of uh, <laughs> it's, um, makes it difficult to interpret. So the trick is that you can actually rewrite this as a, if, if using the help of a symmetric matrix, right? Like A, B over two, oh, sorry, C over two. Right, like this equation becomes this equation, like that's what I was doing last time, a more specific case. That's... So it's kind of, it's easy to construct the matrix. You just read out the numbers multiplying x squared and y squared, and those go along the diagonal. And then the mixed term just gets divided by two and that goes uh, outside the diagonal. Uh, the nice thing of writing it this way is that, uh, is that it becomes a symmetric matrix, right? So this one becomes symmetric. And uh, the point of being symmetric is that it can be diagonalized, right? But remember that it's even better than that. It can be diagonalized uh, if you want using a rotation matrix. So you could write A as R, D, R transpose, where here R is a rotation matrix, right? So R is like a rotation matrix. Uh, this is actually the matrix of eigenvectors uh, if you set them to be of length one. A matrix whose columns that are the eigenvectors. of length one. So it's important for this to be the rotation matrix for the eigenvectors to have length one. Okay, and so if you just plug that in here, you get x, y times r, d, r transpose. times x, y equals d. Okay, now I should stop to see if there are any questions up to this point of what I'm doing. Um,
And the the thing to do is like then once you get to this point is that you kind of think of uh, this matrix times this vector again as giving you the formulas or the entries of two new variables which we call x prime and y prime. So this like the thing we will do is call this x y y prime. Okay. And the thing is that if you do that, this term is just the transpose of this term basically. So this will also be x y x prime y prime. You'll see that. So like what will end up is x y y prime times d. But this is just a matrix of eigenvalues, right? <laughs> uh, like, So once you do that, then it's, this is easy because this equation would just be lambda one x prime squared plus lambda two y prime squared equals d. And the miracle is that under this new axis, um, the mixed term goes away. And so it's kind of straightforward to interpret the, the equation. So actually, I mean, once you have the eigenvalues, in fact, you can kind of identify the equation, if you know what I mean. You'll you'll see that in a moment with a new another example. So what that means is like uh, I mean this is like uh, something very common in physics problems. Uh, probably oh yeah, this is a natural example that um you may have seen like from time to time in these physics problems, right? Like uh that you have like the math right and here along our what is this like some sort of ramp or whatever like i don't know you have a mass like you're moving it along this yeah this ramp and so you're applying like a force here right so you i mean you could if you wanted uh you know you can still analyze you can still decompose the force along the x-axis and the y-axis right but it is kind of useful <laughs> if you have ever done this to rotate the coordinate system, right? If you rotate X and Y, you can rotate it so that the force is aligned, so that it is aligned, for example, with the hypotenuse or the ramp. And uh, the point is that with respect to X prime, Y prime, the force is kind of like horizontal, if, if it kind of makes sense what I'm trying to say. So, uh, so like the point is that sometimes a rotation kind of simplifies how the components of a force or like the components of a vector. And there's something similar happening here where the rotation kind of like simplifies the equation by killing the mixed terms, right? So it just let, it, you just uh, make it go away. Is that making sense? So it, it is a useful trick to have. I mean, what can happen in general, like you could have had like some terms like in this equation that also just involves X and Y. Um, and then there's like, um, like what uh, I guess, like some sort of like translation going on, but like, I'm just trying to think about it in the case um, where there's like a pure rotation. But this, I think this is like a nice example of like how to apply the, uh, the, the diagonalization result. And I like it because it also involves, uh, uh, you know, Nonlinear powers of the variables, and like in linear algebra, if you just work here the word linear, you just think that this can only work where there's like an x or a y, but they're not raised to a higher power. And you see that it actually, if you are clever, you can apply it in different ways to uh, things that involve x squared, y squared, and so on. Yeah. I mean, there's a similar. I mean, there's a similar thing you could do when there's you also have like c squared. It's just that it becomes like a three by three matrix, and then you you. That's how you would kill the mixed terms for uh, ellipsoids or hyperboloids or paraboloids and things like that. It's, it's just that that's too uh, tedious for us to do. But it, it is essentially the same idea. You just uh, um, diagonalize the three by three symmetric matrix. And as I said before, like uh, this is actually, this diagonalization is like uh, similar. I mean, I think I sent you like a YouTube video if you wanted to watch it of how you can justify the secondary derivative test of multivariable calculus uh, using this trick. So it's kind of, um, I mean, it does have many applications, not just to these uh, problems, but also to calculus and things like that. Okay.
So let me give you another example of this. Um, Uh, okay. Let's say I had given you this equation. What did I put out? Oh, here you are. And I asked you basically how does that look, right? Uh, well, because of the mixed term, it's not so clear what this is. It's kind of weird. Like you cannot just read it out so easily. Like, is this going to be a ellipse, a hyperbola, or something else, or what, right? But if you do the trick that I was mentioning, right, um, you can ask, you can rewrite it in this way. So the coefficient multiplying x squared is just one. The mixed term gets divided by two. So you put root of two, or minus root of two, minus root of two. And what's the coefficient multiplying y squared is zero, right? Because there's no y squared around. So you can put like zero here. Does that make sense? So that's the matrix associated to, to this problem. Uh, I can promise you in this final exam, you have to find eigenvalues multiple times. <laughs> uh, so like you will here, we'll have to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this matrix. I mean, they're not too bad because it's just like a two by two matrix. So the eigenvalues are actually lambda one. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm writing the eigenvector. So one eigenvalue is lambda one equals two. And the corresponding eigenvector is u1 minus root of 2, 1. And the other eigenvalue is number 2 equals negative 1. And the corresponding eigenvector is 1 over root of 2, 1. Okay, the, and again, this is where uh, now we do care uh, about the particular eigenvectors that we choose. So these are eigenvectors, it's just that they don't have length one, and we do want the of length one for, for the rotation matrix uh, thing. So, I mean, to compute the lengths of these are, it's not that difficult, like the length of U1 using Pythagoras theorem, right, it's just going to give you root of three. And the vector, the eigenvector that we carry is in the rescaled version. So that's very important in this problem that you should rescale the vector so that it has length one. And the um, the length length of this vector is what um, root of three over two. I mean the numbers are sometimes you should expect to see a lot of square roots in these problems because you have to find their lengths. So they may be a little bit the numbers inside the square roots may be a little bit odd, but. Um,
I mean, it's just, uh, let me actually write here that V1 is going to be, I don't know so if it's clear. V1 is going to be U1 divided by its length, and V2 is going to be V2 divided by its length. There's nothing else that needs to be done because remember, that's another nice thing about symmetric matrices that eigenvectors that correspond to different eigenvalues come already perpendicular. So there's no, like you don't have to worry about the condition that makes uh, guarantees that they're perpendicular orthogonal. They just come for A each for three that they are perpendicular to one another. Questions up to this point. So, once, a, now, once you have the eigenvectors, the idea is you put them uh, in a matrix, right? So, if you put them this way, Uh, if you put them in th that way, it was a determinant of that matrix. It's negative one, right? So it's almost what we want, but we always want for rotation matrix determinant plus one, right? So the the thing that what that tells you, right? So this is determinant negative one. So this is not quite the matrix we want. We wanted where the columns are flipped so that the rotate it is a rotation matrix, right? For a rotation matrix, we need a determinant one. So our matrix R, in fact, is going to be R is going to be the, the same one, but with the columns uh, 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 changed of position. <laughs> And now this one is fine. Okay, this one is good. In fact, this is going to be again, if you want cosine of theta minus sine of theta, sine of theta, cosine of theta. And again, it's not necessarily very few times it will be like a exact angle. Like in this case, you kind of have to approximate it. The, the code the angle is like 54, 55 degrees, roughly. So the angle here would be like 55 degrees. Uh, I'll show that to you in a, in a couple of mon moments where we then with the algebra. Okay, so that means is that we're going to rotate the XY coordinate system by 55 degrees, basically. Is that making sense? Okay. And now it's kind of, everything is automatic. So, so that was the equation, right? Oh, by the way, what's the diagonal matrix? The diagonal matrix is like matrix of eigenvalues, but with the eigenvalues like, you know, uh, following uh, the corresponding order. So the diagonal matrix will be, since I'm, I'm using the pink eigenvalue, it will be negative one first. And then yellow eigenvalue will be second, right? So if this is a diagonal matrix. Okay, so that's what the equation uh, be, uh, was originally. But uh, remember that uh, this is A, which is R, D, R transpose. So this becomes X, Y. Let me put a different color for the, the new matrix. So R is going to be this thing, one over root of three minus two over three, oh, root of that, root of two thirds, one over root of three. These, um, that one that we just saw, negative one, zero, zero, two. And then our transpose, right? Uh, because remember that since this is orthogonal, our transpose is our inverse. So,
And now we're almost done. So if you do that product, this gives you negative one zero zero two times um, the first vector is, oh, everything is divided by root of three. So this is great. So you can put x minus root of two over root of three. And the other is um, root of two x plus y over root of three. Okay. So this is kind of like x prime and this is y prime. And in the other, on the other side, you see the same entries. It's just like written as a as a row vector. So you get x minus root of minus root of two y. Sorry, minus root of two y over root of three, comma root of two x plus y over root of three. Okay, and again, this is like x prime, y prime. That making sense? And so this is a hyperbola, right? Oh, sorry, should have written first the equation. So what does this give you? Like, it would just be, remember, I wrote it here, right? It would just give you minus one, or so minus x prime squared, plus two y prime squared equals four. And I mean, hopefully, hyper the only thing you have to remember about hyperbola is that it's when the signs are opposite. You know, like it's a difference of squares, basically. So this is like the equation for a hyperbola. Yeah. I think the first matrix is one transpose the second one is uh, well, it depends on how you write the the diagonal. The thing is, like the diagonalization could be written in different ways because you could also have written that. D was, it depends if you're solving for A or for, or for D, right? So I think uh, it should be, I think, um, right. In the general case, like it was A Q, D Q inverse, but you could also say D is A inverse, sorry, Q inverse A Q, right? Mm -hmm. So it just depends on which one you had in mind, but if you saw, if you write it for A, it should have been with Q. Is that making sense? Yeah, it, it can be confusing, uh, right? Uh, the, but it does, because it may not be so clear um, whether you're doing this for Q or for, or for D, but like, that's not as much like just write, I would just recommend writing both formulas on the formula sheet, but, if it was for A, that should be fine. Okay, this this should be okay. Question. Mm -hmm. Um, in the blue R matrix, um, the first blue R matrix. Yes. Um, is it is it supposed to be? Oh, oh, okay. Now I get the problem. No. No, okay, no, no. It should have been all right. I just put the trans. That's what you were saying, yeah. right? I think that's what you were trying to say, but in a different way that I didn't understand. Right, like what you're saying is that you should have put like a minus here, right? Yeah. No okay. No, I'm now 100 agree with what all of yours. I mean, it's, it's just that I was trying to say that R is the one that should go first here. It's just that I copied the wrong matrix. You know, is, is that makes sense? Sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you for catching both of you. So, no, I mean it's not like you see. It's, the fix is very easy. You change that into a plus. This one into a minus. Uh, and then this one into this one into a plus and this one into a minus. Okay, so it's like a small fix, but it's it was right. Who here the actual matrix are? Sorry about that. Let's see how this looks in Jajara because it's kind of fun.
So, um, what was the equation? Oh, I have it. I can see it. There. X squared minus two square root of of two times x y equals four. Okay, there is your parabola. But if you think about it, um, it is a has been rotate. It is like the regular parabola, but it has been rotated. You see, usually the parabolas, um, you know, they look either like this or like this. So there was like some sort of rotation applied to them. So let's see, how can you identify that? Well, you can plot here like the, You can plot, for example, the like, vectors. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, right. One vector was uh, the vector. Um, That's it. That was the so that's one of the eigenvectors you see, um, and the other eigenvector was um, what was it? Q. Um, minus this keyword and you can see um y and uh, one over square root three minus yeah okay <laughs> and then the other vector is a vector q. You see, so there is, uh, I mean, I think there's like an option to find the angle between vectors. Uh, oh, angle, right? So if you see, I mean, this is kind of, uh, oh, okay. Let me put the zero. I mean, like, hopefully this is it's clear that, uh, and then I, oh, I should have entered the, the oh, zero, zero. Okay. So, up oh, here you can see that the angle is 90 degrees, right, between these two axes, which makes sense because like the angle vectors are always perpendicular, right? And then if you want, you can introduce like an, uh, the, a vector representing the x-axis, which is, um, you know, this i, the i vector or whatever. Okay, and then you can measure the angle. Let me see if I can erase the angle of uh, uh, All right, and then you can measure the angle between this eigenvector and this, uh, the, the x-axis. So, Oh, no, this is being there you go. So it's like about very explicit. It's about fifty-four degrees, right? Which is what I was telling you. So what that means is that if you rotate the x-y coordinate system into one that's aligned with these two eigenvectors, then like the parabola, the hyperbola does look like a your down like the standard hyperbola. Oh, does that make sense? Yeah. When the orbit first are 55 degrees, did you just know, I've seen that before or is that something we came up with? Oh, no, 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 I, okay. I um, uh, <laughs> went to Wolfram Alpha and I wrote our cosine of one over root of three and I got like 50.7, so I just rounded it up. Yeah, but it, since it's not a special angle, I wouldn't expect you to. It's 
<laughs> right. You, I mean, you don't need it at all except for like to make the pro the picture a little bit more realistic. As long as you understand that it's in the first quadrant, right? Because I mean, the the cosine is positive and the sine is also positive, right? So like the first axis is still in the first quadrant. That's kind of enough for me. If I ask you for a picture, I'm not expecting you to say, I mean, I would try to cook it up so that the angle is a special one, one basically. Do not go into this problem. Do you know what I mean? But like the thing is like in most problems, like you just end up getting like a weird angle, right? Because um, essentially the, like the angle, the cosine of the angle is going to be one of the entries, the first entry of one of the first eigenvector, right? So that usually is just going to be some random number. You cannot expect it always to be such an, a nice one. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, because the thing is like otherwise there's really not like a good way to, to identify the figure. Um, this right again. This could like this looks like less of a yeah. useful tool these days because you can just put it on a judge right, right, and you kind of see what it looks like. But back in the day, what else would you have done, right? Um, but also like again, like this method of like diagonalizing the, I mean, getting rid of the mixed terms, which is what we're doing here, is kind of useful for other things like again, like proving the second derivative test in multivariable calculus other things like which have have nothing to do necessarily with just like trying to find how the the equations look like if that makes sense yeah but we so we can determine the shape pretty much after we get the eigenvalues right yeah it is uh that's uh, i agree with that now um you can identify the shape just based on the eigenvalues yes uh, if you want to look a little bit more information like you know uh like say, if you actually wanted to try to draw it, you at least need some idea of how much of a, of a rotation had you had to do, right? Yeah. So that's I mean I may that's why I will ask a little at least um for the angle of rotation, and again I'll just try to make the angle uh, the rotation like a special degree angle so that you can identify identify it easily, but it's not enough, you know. Right, if you just care about knowing the shape, yeah, the, the eigen, in fact, only the signs of the eigenvalues matter. It's only important to know if they're both positive, both negative, or have opposite signs, right? That's kind of like enough. But um, to say a little, I mean, you know, if you wanted something more detailed, you would uh, need need to at least find the angle of rotation. I was like, I find it like a nice application to, to kind of see it. Up. Um, any other questions about this? Okay, let me give you another application. I mean, I'll just show you about this one. If I find my thing to connect the app. Uh, so who knows what's in a spectrometer? What is it? It's like, is that what the internal thing that was? Uh, well, right. So the thing is, like, I mean, you can pro uh, you're probably familiarized with this thing that if you take like a prism or something like that, and you have like light, you just break the prism just breaks the light into the different colors. Well, let's say of the rainbow or whatever, right? Um, so the thing, uh, the, there's like a thing called in chemistry of spectroscopy where you can identify like every every element in the atomic table has like produced uh, as its own spectrum of light. So let me show you what this looks like.
I don't know if you can see those bars, right? So the thing is, right, um, the, yeah, you can think of this like as the idea of, uh, of <laughs> an element. So what people found, I guess, somewhere, somewhere around the 19th century, early 20th century, was that um, if you have like, um, what, you have like a gas, you put it like in, um, in a container and you pass like an electric current through it, uh, then the gas will emit some light, but it will only emit light at certain frequencies. So kind of like these frequencies, like, you know, so for example, hydrogen would emit light at those frequencies that you see in those colors. And helium, and in fact, this is kind of how helium was found, that they just identify a gas with a different like spectrum. That's actually what, how, what this is called, the spectrum of the atom. Okay, and so, and lithium has a different spectrum. You see, like every uh, every element uh, has its own uh, spectrum. The spectrum just means like these lines that you see here. And like you know, the more complicated the atom, it seems like the richer the spectrum, right? I mean, it's it's kind of like interesting to see, or more. You actually can start thinking, well, is there like a pattern to this, right? Like, how do you understand? Is there like a formula to for finding, oops, I clicked on one of them. Oh, in fact, yeah, what happens if I click on, uh, let's click on oxygen just because that's important. Uh, uh, yeah, so it tells you like the wavelength and it gives you like it too, it's if you useful information. Okay, so there, like at the beginning, there was like this uh, efforts to identify the spec, like understand why the spectrum of the atoms work the way, the way they do. And essentially, I mean, Long story short, because obviously this is not kind of how um, it appears at first. But um, I mean, if you want like a very rough model of what's going on, you can think of um, just like for the case of hydrogen, right? Like a hydrogen, you could think of it as a proton and an electron, right? Um, so you have probably these models that you have seen of <laughs> early models of like an atom, right? Where like the electron kind of like orbits the the proton, uh, like in circular orbits. Uh, now, what I mean, essentially, that was a problem back in the day because if you have an electron orbiting, you know, you probably have seen Coulomb's law where like uh, charges of opposite signs attract. Right. So if you had like what happens like if you had like the electron orbiting the proton, it would accelerate and then it would emit light. And if by emitting light it would lose energy. So the question was kind of like how do you how do you explain why the electron doesn't just like fall into the nucleus and everything collapses? So that's actually called the problem of stability of matter. Like why is matter stable? Why it doesn't just like everything collapse into the nucleus? Um, so what um, Bohr and um, I think Rutherford and other people came up with the idea was like, no, well, so there's going to be um, the electron is allowed will exist in certain uh, what they call stationary stationary states, and that uh, stationary state is actually described by a vector. That vector is actually called like a wave function. Look, but it's like a minor detail thing here. And that vector is an eigenvector of a matrix. So that matrix, um, I mean, this matrix is called the Hamiltonian, or, or, but it doesn't matter too much for this, uh, for what I'm trying to say. The important thing is that the, the electron is described by a vector. Which is an eigenvector, and the eigenvalue is the energy of the electron in that state. Okay, and then uh, and then what happens? Like the reason why these things emit light is that sometimes an electron may jump between our orbits. So if it had like an, an, an if it had like an eigenvalue one here, and it has an eigenvalue of energy two in this different orbit, there then there's like an energy difference, right? And that's kind of essentially proportional to the frequency of the light that's being emitted. So the way they kind of like um, 
the way they kind of like understood the the this problem was that the these uh these lines are just like the energy difference of the electron when as it transitions between different orbits. Like you may have seen this if you have taken a chemistry where they talk about the you know well the principal number and other things of like a of a molecule. Um, and then uh, when you jump between levels, uh, there's an energy difference, um, and that kind of determines the frequency of the of the light. And but here the important thing is that um, right, these are actually eigenvalues of a matrix, and this matrix is actually symmetric, for example. So this is a symmetric matrix. I mean, of course, I'm putting a lot of things under the rug. For example, the matrix is infinite dimensional, so it has like infinite, so infinite rows, infinite columns. Like there are some technicalities that happen here, but it is more or less like um, that's kind of how matrices were introduced, like into um, you know why engineers and physicists study matrices because back in the day, it's not something they were too acquainted with. Um, and that's another reason why the eigenvalues of a matrix sometimes are called the spectrum because it just refers to this spectroscopy thing when, when it was historically found. So you may hear from time to time like the word the spectrum of a matrix, it refers to the eigenvalues of the matrix. And it just comes like, you know, it's like a leftover from those days where like people were discovering um, um, how like these uh, early models of matter work. Okay. So it's a computed, um, it's a cute um, example of how, um, of how this uh, linear algebra based process has happened. So yeah, like all these uh, questions about uh, stability of matter, uh, this what's called quantum mechanics, it's really like linear algebra essentially uh, applied over and over. Um, Okay, so the last topic for today, uh, which is the one that I'll finish on Monday, and that will be, um, yeah, probably the last topic for the exam, is about the, um, orthogonal projections and orthogonal subspaces. So let me... Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you a question about the last example before we move on? Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, what is the... What is the degree of rotation referencing? How much the diagonal matrix is rotated or how, how much matrix A rotates? Oh, the like Y axis? Here, you mean? No, 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 the, uh, the previous example. And this example? Yeah, so we got theta was 55 degrees. Right, right, right. That that refers to the angle between the first eigenvector, the, eigenvec the first column of the matrix and the X axis. Okay. Is that what you were asking me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's like how much you have to rotate the vector I in order to get to the first second vector. Oh, okay. Yeah, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so now, um, This is a, uh, a nice topic, so.
I will just do some examples. Just, I mean, we don't have that much time left. So I'll just uh, tell you what the definition is, do an example or two, and then next time I'll give you like the main properties of this. So V is going to be a vector space. And your orthogonal complement just consists in all vectors that are perpendicular to it. Okay. This is how it's denoted. Um, this symbol somehow has been taken to represent perpendicularity. So this is called the orthogonal complement to B. Okay, and this consists of the vectors. Consists of the vectors which are um, perpendicular to every vector of B. Which are particular So just to make a picture first, uh, because that's actually the, the example I want to deal with today. Imagine that the vector space that I give you right, like the vector space that I give you are the points in R3 with x plus y plus z equals being equal to zero. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I may have said this a couple of times. If you actually wanted to uh, represent that, this would look like a plane, right, in space. So uh, the orthogonal complement just means all the vectors that are perpendicular to this plane, basically. Okay, so let's stop here. I have my, my pencil. So it's kind of like the vectors that make a 90 degree angle with, with the piece of paper. Is that making sense? So, um, How, how could you find the orthogonal complement? How to find these B perp? There's also, you could pronounce it B perp if you want perp or perpendicular. So how to find Well, the thing is that, um, an easy way to do this is uh, a way that I like to do this is just that um, what the, uh, you can find a basis for V, and also just to emphasize again this thing about finding basis. So you can find a basis for V and then what you um, what you do is like find the vectors that are perpendicular to every element in the basis. Okay. And then you find uh, 
which are perpendicular to every element of the base. What, and these vectors are will form the orthogonal complement. These vectors make up the curve. Uh, why? I mean, the idea to have in mind is, like, say. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm about to find a basis for B, but like B, the basis for B will have two vectors in this case. If you remember how we were finding basis earlier in the second midterm. So let's say that this is like the first basis vector and this one is maybe the second basis vector, right? They live on the plane. So any other vector is a linear combination. Any other vector of this vector space is a linear combination of the basis. That's what it means to be a basis. So if you guarantee that the angle between uh, a vector and the basis is 90 degrees because of the linear combination property, that just forces the angle between that vector and everything else on the to be to be zero. Because um, let's say, for example, that you, oops, let's pick up a different color. That you is like the vectors that are perpendicular to V1 and V2, right? Then what happens here? If it happens that u dot v1 equals zero and u dot v2 equals zero, right? But if we choose a random vector of the plane or on the vector space, then this other vector would be a linear combination of v1 and v2. Right, so what is the dot product between u and v? Well, it's the dot product between u and c1 v1 plus c2 v2. But the thing is that the dot product is trivial, so this gives you c1 u dot v1 plus c2 u dot v2. So this was already zero, and this was already zero. So what I'm trying to say is that the distribute, distributive property of the dot product guarantees that once you have two, uh, a vector perpendicular to the basic vectors, then that forces the vector to remain perpendicular to any other any other linear combination. Is that making sense, Kevin? So it's nice because then that just reduces the problem to first find a basis and then just check the condition for a vector to be perpendicular to that basis. And then of course we'll give you a system of linear equations. So back to beginning of linear knowledge about how do you solve a system of linear equations. I mean, uh, let's tr try to do it here. So what is the basis for B in this particular case? Anyone remember how do you find the basis in this case? What did you have to do? Right, let, let's just write x in terms of y and t, for example. Yeah. So x, y, z becomes like minus y minus z, y, z, right? So this was y times negative 1, 1, 0, plus um, z negative one zero one right so the basis right the basis was v1 equals the basis is v1 equals negative one one zero and v2 equals negative one zero one is that making sense so any vector um 
here on the vector spaces are the near combination of those two. So how do you find uh, B curve? Let's see if I wrote it explicitly. Huh. Yeah. Well, what is a vector in, in B pair? It's a vector that's perpendicular to every vector here, but that just means that it has to be perpendicular to these basic vectors. So what you need is like, um, let's call this vector B uh, or U, maybe to not confuse them. What I want is u dot v one v zero and u dot v two to v zero, right? So this gives you x y z dot negative one one zero equals zero, and then this one gives you x y z dot negative one zero one equals zero, right? And so what does it? This gives you a system of equations, right? It gives you negative x plus y equals zero and um, negative x plus z equals zero. Does that make sense? Of course, this system is super easy to solve, but I'm just going to set it up in matrix notation so that it looks a little bit closer to what will happen in general. So in matrix notation, what is this? It's negative one, one, zero, right? It's a homogeneous system, right? So in matrix notation, this is negative one, um, one, zero, right? And negative one, zero, one, And I mean, to solve this system is very easy. You can do it like minus row one plus row two into row two. So that gives you negative one, one, zero. And then, and again, this is an overkill. It's highly unnecessary to do it this way, but it is uh, just to illustrate the point. So then you can do, row two plus row three to reduce this matrix, row three. And now this is row reduced, right? And this tells you what, that uh, minus x plus z equals zero, and minus y plus z equals zero. And so z equals x, equals y, so the solution is x equals y equals c. Right. So a vector in B pair, right? A vector in B pair, it was x y z, but this is x times one one one. Right. So that means that any vector that's perpendicular to the basis it has to be a multiple of one one and one. Okay. And this vector one 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 is actually called the normal vector of the plane, if you have seen that before. So um, any other vector is actually just a multiple of this one. Yeah. Um, 
the second operation that we wrote to plus or three. Um, oh, from here to here. Um, sorry, oops, <laughs> row two plus row one, right? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Is that making sense? Again, of course, like from this system of equations, but you can kind of see that x has to be y equals c. It's a, so it's a bit of an overkill, but it, um, it, it does tell you the general strategy of what's going to work. Because what happened here, we created a homogeneous system, right? And what are the rows of this homogeneous system? The rows of this homogeneous system are the basis vectors for the vector space, okay? And so that's going to happen in general. So to find the orthogonal complement, you just solve a homogeneous system where the rows of the matrix are the basis for B. Okay, so let me write that down because that's actually the most important thing for today. Um, well, before I write it down, is, are there any questions? For, uh, because that would be like the last thing I write uh, today. That making sense so far so good. So here's a, the algorithm to, for finding B perp in general. So how do you find B perp? You find the basis for B first. So you find a basis for B. Call this uh, B1 up to BK, uh, call these vectors. Then you make a matrix whose rows are these vectors. So make a matrix A. Rows are V1 up to VK. So what I'm trying to say is that A is the vector V1 followed by the vector V2 blah, 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 up to the vector VK. And then V perp is the solutions to the homogeneous system. But what, I mean, there was another name that we gave to the solutions of the homogeneous system of a linear, system of linear equations, right? What was the? Huh? the trivial solution? Well, I mean, only, uh, that's a specific solution of the homogeneous system, but there was a name for all the solutions. Space yeah, it was the null space of A. So V perp is like, let me write that in a different color just to emphasize it. So again, like this is what I'm saying. Like we go back to the usual stuff of before. Like so, uh, <laughs> V perp is just a null space. So it's just the solutions to A x equals zero. That make sense? So I, this is kind of like illustrates the point in which the the, the final is cumulative because this problem about finding B perp is just really a problem about finding a basis and then just finding an all space. It's now that we just give like this extra interpretation to what we're doing, but it is not like a new technique, right? It just like what we were doing before. Is that making sense? In, yeah. the, the strategy would work if we didn't find the basis and we just had linearly dependent vectors, right? And I mean, uh, as long as it as long as it generate the the vector space, yes. So there would be a chance about right, right, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. It's true. As long as the vector, I mean, you can like, I right here, like, um, it's just kind of more efficient or minimalistic to just use the basis. 
But right, if you had like a set that generate is you can do the same as this works. It's just a uh, um, in general, I do like the idea of just finding the basis because the basis is kind of like really the minimum amount of information that you need to reconstruct the entire vector space. So that's kind of why it's better to find a basis rather than just a set that generates. But yeah, the point is that a deep perp is a it's a null space, and because it's a null space, like it it means in particular that it's also a vector space, which may not have been so obvious from the definition. So in particular. D pair is a vector space of what's the dimension? What's going to be what was the formula for the dimension for for a vector the, the null space? What was the dimension? Yeah. It was just a nullity. Good. So it was a nullity of A. But what was the nullity of A? Wasn't there like a number of columns minus the rank of A, something like that? So there you go. Right, yeah, and that's a good observation. So if you kind of take a vector, like any random vector in the world is like a sum of a vector in B and a sum in, in the complement, in the orthogonal complement. So it actually allows you to give a decomposition of any vector into something in B and something in the orthogonal. Yeah, that's a good uh, good thing to notice. Uh, in fact, we'll use it next time. That's probably where I want to finish. Uh, well, next time I'll just rewrite for you the this fundamental theorem of linear algebra, which I had mentioned like a long time ago, but we really never used it, but it's still like a nice observation to have, um, which is like the, the null space is like the orthogonal complement to the row space. I think that's how it went. And then the null space of a transpose is a orthogonal complement to the column space of A. I'm pretty sure I'm not missing, I'm messing this up. That should be fine. But, uh, uh, it's kind of just uh, useful to have um, have around. In fact, yeah, I think I, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is okay. So, so I'll write that down for you. And then what I do, where I want, I do want to finish the course is that you can find a matrix. There's a nice uh, thing that you can do. So if you take a vector, which kind of we already talked about this. But now we do have the tools to do it more like uh, explicitly. So if you have like a vector V, there is a way to find the shadow of V on this plane, like to project V onto the plane. And that can be represented by a matrix. So next time I'll tell you how to represent that operation in terms of a matrix using the spectral theorem, because that matrix will be symmetric. So you can or like diagonalize it or orthogonally, and that's how you can find it in practice. So that I think would be a good place to end the material for the final, uh, just like showing you how to do that. So, and then on Wednesday, we would do the review. And on Monday, uh, again, I will just do it more like kind of office hours. You can come if you want to ask me something, you need, uh, we can discuss more specific things of where you're stuck. But um, but yeah, uh, it's on, I think there's only one more topic left for us, which is how to find this protection matrix. Okay, so. Yeah, I'll see you next week. I'll try to post the solutions to the assignments by the end of uh, tomorrow or Friday. And I'll just, there will be just one more assignment on Canvas. And again, I'll get back to questions about the midterm grade towards the end of the week. I'll start reviewing uh, your grade scope request uh, because I have to finish some other things first. But yeah, feel free to leave.